This is in the midst, by the way, of what we call the holiness codes of Leviticus. Leviticus 19, this is where God is saying, this is how you're going to live as my holy people. What does he front? What does he prioritize? What does he put forward to the people? It's this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. If, if it's a theology of holiness, it's a theology of grace. If it's a theology of holiness, it's a theology of love. Welcome to the Not Ashamed podcast, where we are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. We are here to help you rebuild your theology in light of God's grace, love, and the true meaning of holiness. The topic for this month is, what is holiness? We are joined by special guest, Josh Ratliff. I'm Natalie Edmondson from Berean Holiness. And today I have our panelists, Andrew, Bethany, and our special guest, Josh. So I'd love to, let's go ahead and just start with introduction questions. So first, um, well, I've already said your names. So Bethany, go ahead okay. and this is start us out. Who are you? Um, what kind of background are you from? And also let's do an icebreaker question today. What is one of the most interesting or your one of the most one of the most favorite that did not work? Um, one of your one most of favorite places that you've that you've been? Okay, so um, my name is Bethany. I'm a wife and a mom. I come from a UPCI background, born and raised all of my life. Um, but I would say my most favoriteest place, and I'll say it that way. Um, currently was we took our daughter to Disney World this year for the first time and when you take a four-year-old to Disney World it's magical all over again and we met a princess and we met Minnie Mouse so that would currently be my favorite place in the entire world. Sweet awesome also I totally guessed you were gonna say Disney. <laughs> yeah, you now have you been to Disneyland and Disney World? Just Disney World but I'm kind of secretly already planning Disneyland like maybe Maybe next year, year two. Okay, so we'll have to do. have you back on so you can tell us which one's better. <laughs> that sounds great. Andrew, who are you? What do you do? And uh, what's your favorite place? Yes. Or one of them. <laughs> yeah, so my name's Andrew. Um, I also come from a UPCI background. Um, was born and raised into it. Um, and while serving in uh, the church that I attended before. I was uh, the media director. Um, I was a youth pastor for the junior high students, uh, did Sunday school, uh, college and career. So I was kind of involved in uh, multifaceted ministries um, throughout the my time spent at the church. Um, and as far as one of my most favorite places to have visited, um, has to definitely have been Iceland. Uh, so we were fortunate to go visit Iceland uh, a couple of years ago, my wife and I, and um, just stunning landscapes. You know, it's to totally not used to anything like that, having grown up in like, um, I, I grew up in Louisiana, and then I moved to Texas, and that's pretty much all I've known up until like later in my adult life where we got the opportunity to travel. So um, it was very exciting just to see, you know, totally untouched landscape, um, just very surreal. So definitely would love to go again. One of my most all-time favorite places to visit. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And before I officially introduce our guest, um, I guess I should answer the icebreaker question too. Uh, so, you know, the first thing that pops into my head about favorite places, I think in my least favorite places, just the other day I was at a clinic and someone was asking me, you know, how's Paris? Like, because they heard I'd gone before. And anyways, someone was expecting that to be my favorite place. And I'm just like, oh, it was disgusting. It was trash. It was full of rats. Um, and they were very, very rude to me in my experience. Uh, yeah. So first thing I think of is not my favorite place. Um, and But my favorite place would probably be Ireland. Ireland was one of the few places that it... It meets the stereotype. There are a lot of other places that I've been privileged to go to and just been so disappointed. But Ireland absolutely 
gorgeous. Mm-hmm. And I actually did get to go to Iceland too on a layover. That was really nice. Um, but I, I, I like the weather in Ireland better. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. For sure. Um, so Josh, you are our special expert <laughs> for this panel discussion. We are so glad to have you. Uh, so tell us a little bit about your educational background, church background, and who you are, where you're from, and don't forget your favorite place. <laughs> well, thank you, Natalie. Thanks for having me on. Um, so educational background, since you asked for that. So I uh, did my bachelor's degree in uh, religion at Liberty University and uh, did a master's in biblical studies at Asbury Seminary after that. And so as far as church background goes, um, so I kind of am a, a little bit diverse in, in terms of maybe some of your listeners, but I think there's maybe some overlap in all of my background. So what I'm, what I mean by that is I had a grandfather who was the pastor of a, of a large independent fundamental Baptist church. And that was on my mother's side of the family, but on my dad's side of the family, which is where, um, I first learned about you, Natalie, it was through the holiness Pentecostal side of, of the, uh, tribe. So essentially I kind of have both of those two backgrounds, um, in my history. And, um, when I became a student at Liberty University, I got involved in a Wesleyan church. And so that's where I am today. I'm an ordained minister in the Wesleyan church. And I actually now I'm the lead pastor of the church that I uh, attended while I was a student at Liberty University. So it's kind of a a long story of how I got from um, the Holiness Pentecostal side to the Wesleyan Church. Uh, Maybe we'll get into a little bit of that, but uh, that's where I am today. And then you asked about my place that I visited. So my favorite place is very easy to answer without a doubt. It is Israel, which I think is probably a good, um, you know, place for a discussion like this. But I I feel like um, when you're reading the Bible before you visit Israel, it's like you're reading it in 2D. And after you visit Israel, it's like you're reading it in 3D, because Mm -hmm. it seems like just especially as you read the Gospels and you are able to visualize where Jesus walked and you can see it in your head because you walked those same places. Um, There's just nothing like that. So I recommend it to everybody. um, Try to go to Israel. It's a, it's an amazing experience. Wow. That's awesome. Thanks so much for sharing. And I am slightly jealous. I'm sure that would be one of my top favorites if I was able to make it there. I actually was going to try. I had a plan to try and then COVID and then I got married. So still working on it. (laughs) But moving, we're just going to dive right into our topic today. And our topic today is what is holiness? So you mentioned um, that you come from, well, part of your family is from the the Holiness Pentecostal background. And that is the same group of Holiness Pentecostals that I was, same loose independent fellowship that I also grew up in and have family in. So it's interesting though, when you take a biblical concept and you use it as your denominational name, um, some misunderstandings that can happen. And I'm sure we're not the only denomination fellowship to have experienced that before. Um, But in my growing up, in my personal experience, holiness was very associated with our group to the point um, that there was, I'll share my story on another episode, but long story short, I now am part of a different church, uh, church fellowship, church organization. And I ran into a minister a few years back. And when I told him um, that I was no longer going to a holiness church, the holiness with, you know, the name on the door, I was quoted the scripture in Hebrews that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And I was so taken aback because I'm just like, you know, that verse wasn't talking about a church organization. Um, but come to think of it, you know, 10 years ago, I might not, not, not have known that just because I had so many misunderstandings about what biblical holiness is. And it's taken years of just restudying and trying to look at the Bible without that, um, lens of misunderstanding, misunderstandings and misconceptions that I had before, uh, to just rebuild what does the Bible teach about holiness and parse that out from, you know, my own misconceptions. 
So in my own personal experience, I'm going to, I'll share a little bit about what that misconception looked at, looked like. Um, and then Andrew and Bethany, I'd love to hear if you had anything similar coming from the would you you would have called it holiness standards and in, in oneness, correct? You would still refer to it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So holiness standards, but inside of a different denomination that doesn't call itself holiness, but still the misunderstandings, I think. Anyways, I'll let you explain when we get to. <laughs> but for me personally, it was very, very much works focused. Um, but to the point of earning holiness, where it's like, if I do this, this, and this, then I can be a holy person. And a lot of times, though, uh, those works, and I think we'll dive into this later when we ask you the questions, Josh, but a lot of those works that I associated with, this is how I become holy, were very much, well, I'm supposed to wear sleeves that are to my elbows, and I'm not supposed to wear a necklace. And um, always wear a jean skirt. If I do those things, if I go to church three times a week, um, then I can be a good holiness girl. And that was like the highest compliment, um, especially for me as a teenager, was to be called, oh, she's such a good holiness girl. And I associated holiness so closely with just our our church's denominational standards and traditions. Um, and it was so performance-based. It was so works-focused. It was so outward uh, appearance. And I think I really miss the heart of what holiness is all about, but not only fundamentally, the, the layer down is the fact that I thought holiness could be earned, is the fact that I thought if I just checked this checklist, that I have holiness. Um, and because of that, my sense of holiness was had so much insecurity in it because it was all dependent on me. It all came back to me. And that also meant that I had to check the checklist to please God and to have a relationship with God. So it's like if I if I um did everything right that day, then I felt good going to God at, in prayer that night. But if I didn't, okay, now I'm avoiding God <laughs> because, you know, holiness, everything's all on me. Um, and it was so, my my brother Nathan said he was listening to a sermon the other day and his pastor said the litmus test of a healthy relationship with your earthly father, and this translate also to our heavenly father, is if when you mess up, do you run to him or do you run away from him? And if the first thing you do when you feel like you haven't measured up or done enough, if you run away from your father or if you run away from God, that's not a healthy, good relationship. We should. Yes, we're sorrowful. Yes, we're repentant. But we still should feel safe and secure coming to God and saying, hey, I messed up. Um, help me. And and having that safety and that security within our relationship with God. And that's something I did not experience growing up. (laughs) I could go on. I will, I'll stop right there. And I'd love to know from, from you guys, Bethany and Andrew, what your experience was with holiness growing up, if you had a biblical understanding, or if you had some confusion as well. And Bethany, we'll start with you. Okay. So I would say mine ties into yours, but I'm going to take it a different explanation path. I I feel like they're incredibly similar. When I grew up um, and even into adulthood, and I still struggle with it sometimes, my understanding of holiness was holiness was a lifestyle that you had to live, which to live it, you had to do X, Y, Z. It was a requirement to do this, the way you looked, the way you did your hair, what you put on, Everything was appearance-based, but holiness was a lifestyle that you made the choice to do, and you had to do X, 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 Y, and Z, and therefore, if you did all these things, then you would be considered holy. So you had to achieve it, and you had to achieve it and look apart, because holiness 
was your appearance. It was how you appeared to others because it was your calling card. It was your witness. You had to be recognized on the outside as holy. And you had to only achieve that way by these obvious steps. So I grew up thinking, well, I have to put on this certain outfit and do my hair in this certain way and make sure that when I walk into Walmart, everyone through the entire store, when I walk by, they will recognize me and know automatically, oh, she's holiness because of the way she looks. She has holiness. She has that look. She has that identity. And I think that's really how it was perceived, at least in my mind, growing up and seeing all these things, all of these people that were called holy and they were commended for their holiness. It was all people who fit into this certain mold of their appearance, especially like as a girl growing up in it. If I wanted to be good and I wanted to be holy and I wanted to be recognized, which I did, I wanted to serve my whole life. I wanted to be commended. I wanted to be on the stage talking and I wanted to be there. I don't want to say in the spotlight, but I wanted to be used by God there for people to see for whatever was needed. So I felt a lot of pressure that I had to look a certain way and fit into a certain identity that was described as holiness. And this was how you got it by doing these things. So I would definitely put my understanding of what holiness is and how it was achieved by looking a certain way and dressing a certain way to fit into a certain mold. So for me, it was the hair, the dress, the heels, all of it. And that that's how I've associated it for most of my life is something that you did and something that you wore to fit into a certain look. It was an identity, a lifestyle that you lived. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Andrew? (laughs) Yeah. So um, the way that I kind of was taught and understood it is pretty much in line with how you guys mentioned it. Um, But our church was a little, um, I guess it differed a little bit in that it was very um, focused on um, the gifts and how that holiness somehow tied to that. And Um, so the way that I saw it growing up was that, you know, there's a base level of restrictions and checklists that you're supposed to adhere to, that these are just kind of understood as if you don't do these, then it's obvious that you, um, haven't fully committed to, to, to Christ. And so therefore you're unsaved, right? So, uh, for guys, it wasn't as nearly as strict in my particular church. Like we had the prohibitions for jewelry and for, uh, short, but really most of the the um, responsibility was was born onto the to the ladies, where you know they had all these special restrictions of like sleeve length, you know dress length, and you know all those things. And my wife would tell me how much easier us guys had it. Um, but for us guys in the church, especially those of us who are very interested in wanting to serve God and being uh, wholly committed. Um, and devout, they, uh, we started getting this notion that um, the more you sacrificed was somehow um, how you demonstrated that you had or you were, ex- you were uh, exhibiting holiness in your life. Um, and it was very ambiguous. It would shift from season to season, year to year, teachings would shift and Um, the way that I saw it was, um, I don't know, like if you play some of these old school video games, they'd have like this, these meters or these gauges displayed on the screen and the, the meter would fill up in, in our case, the more holy things you did, it would fill up. And if you reach certain thresholds, God would like grant you different, um, different abilities and I don't mean that to sound kind of like overly silly, but we uh, honestly, that's how we practiced it, you know? So we, um, we um, like immortalize certain individuals in our church that, you know, exhibited these traits that, you know, brother so-and-so, like he's, he's so hardcore, like he, he, he's never touched a TV, um, you know, he, he doesn't go to theme parks whatsoever and, you know, 
we would say all these things. And because of that, that's why he's such an incredible preacher. And he has all these stories of healings and God miraculously gave him the, these abilities to preach better than anyone else. And, um, and so we always aspire to do similar things and, and it would manifest different ways for us, um, where we, we would make these different kind of self restrictions that weren't necessarily outlined in the Bible where you would say, well, I don't drink these particular like sodas because of who the, the company is affiliated with, or I don't go into these stores, um, because of the brands that they, um, they carry, you know, and somehow that made us holier than one another. And it was always a constant game of like, who could do the most of holiest things and how that would grant them the ability to be, you know, some supernatural, um, just, uh, maestro, you know, in the church. And of course, we're all struggling with different kinds of sins and those things never really were addressed. Like those kinds of sins were not addressed with those kind of behaviors. So, yeah, that is so interesting to me how how you said like you unlock new powers the more you fill up those <laughs> yeah. meters. Um because I can relate to that so much because there were there were, you know, the those personal convictions they called them. I'm not always sure if that's the appropriate biblical term for them, but um anyways, so they would say, well, this person has personal convictions against um against three quarter length sleeves. So they only wear long sleeves and this person has a conviction against open toed shoes. This person has a conviction against, um, the color red, you know, stuff like that. And it would be stuff that the church didn't teach, but then they'd be like, well, don't you, you can't make fun of them though. Cause look, look how God uses them because they gave up, you know, this, that, or the other. And I've, I've heard that. I, you know, I know of, um, just, like things like not uh, women not plucking their their eyebrows and other women saying, you know, God hasn't dealt with me to do it, but if he did, I would because look how he uses her because she doesn't do that. And I was just like, I'm not sure it's a cause and effect quite like that, but that was that was absolutely the mindset that the more you sacrifice stuff that God never asked, stuff that the Bible um, never taught, but the more that you sacrifice, the more spiritual power you're going to unlock. Um, and mm -hmm. wow, that definitely affected me because I would give up. I gave up a lot of stuff, um, especially in my teenage years thinking like, why, why am I not healing the, you know, raising the dead and, and healing the sick? It must be, I haven't given up enough up. So I just give up more and more and more until I was burnt out, exhausted, starving, sometimes literally, um, and still just so much shame because I'm still not holy enough to have these powers. So, wow. Yeah, I can relate to that a lot. Let's go ahead and turn to Josh now. Um, and Josh, we are looking forward to you sharing some more of the scriptural foundation for holiness. This is something we've all been studying for years, but yeah, I'm always taking off another layer and just like, oh, wow, that was a misunderstanding too. Um, so yeah, we're really excited to, to hear what you're, you have for us. So my first question for you, Josh, is what is a biblical definition of holiness? Um, and, and we'd love to hear the Greek word as well. Well, thanks again um, for the opportunity to talk about it. And, um, you know, I, I, I just relate to so much of what you all have already said, um, just on a personal level. And um, specifically, I think the ironic thing for me, and I'm just speaking for me, I don't know if you guys can relate to this, is I didn't really start thinking deeply and biblically about a theology of holiness until... Um, I was no longer in the particular movement that was referred to as as a holiness Pentecostal movement. And, and part of that was that um, there was some sense of an idea about the definition of the word. So if you if you were to ask, you know, a preacher or a pastor, like, well, what, what does the word mean? Well, it means to be set apart, you know, and, and that that is an aspect. That, that is true. That is an aspect of the word, and they've clearly read that in some book that they've studied. 
And they're not wrong. That's an aspect of it. It's not all of it. Holiness is like a diamond and there's many different aspects to it. But what kind of happened was, I think, and the reason that we sort of um, didn't pay a lot of attention to a deep understanding of holiness theology through scripture is that we took the definition, it's to be set apart, and then we extrapolated from the definition and said, so, hey, if you want to be set apart, then you better look set apart. Because if I can't pick you out, you know, right, Bethany, as soon as I go into Walmart, if I can't pick you out from the Baptist girl or the Methodist girl uh, or the atheist girl, God forbid, then, then, then you're not really set apart. What sets you apart then? And so that's that was kind of how it was extrapolated. Of course, my thinking on that was always, well, how come we're letting the Amish one up us on now? I mean, we we shouldn't let them one up us because they're much more set apart than we are. We're kind of blending in a little more than they are, right? So again, I, I don't want to go off on that tangent. I just want to use that to illustrate that it seemed more often that we were focused on that one aspect of the definition and never really taught. From Genesis to Revelation, what does God actually say about holiness when this word comes up, um, when he's telling his people to be holy? And so, yeah, we can we can certainly go there. I'm excited that we can actually go through scripture um, together. And before I do that, let me just say I am indebted to John Oswalt, who, in my view, is one of the greatest communicators of holiness theology alive today. I think anybody should check him out. He's got a little book called Called to be Holy, and uh, it's just a fantastic biblical view of of, uh, holiness theology. Um, So the Hebrew term, right, for holiness, um, it comes from the Hebrew root kodesh, and it refers to, of course, as we've already said, being set apart or sacred. Um, It refers to God being exalted above humanity, above his creation. So God is very much filling the universe. He's in his creation, but he's very much separate from it in a holy way. Um, But in addition to that, it also is is talking about the moral purity of God. So in the Greek New Testament, you have a couple of cognates, and they are hagia and hagiasmos. And these two particular terms essentially carry the same definition. When When the New Testament authors are quoting the Old Testament authors and using the Septuagint. They're bringing these Greek terms, Hagia and Hagiosmos, with them. So um, it's it's interesting to look at the world of the Old Testament, in which God tells his people that he's holy and they're to be holy as he is. And to understand that the other cultures around Israel also had an understanding of that word holy and holiness. Um, other cultures, pagan cultures, cultures that worship false gods, they called their gods holy. They would even call um, temple prostitutes holy. They they would call cultic priests holy. Um, Because why? They were set apart for the sacred duties of their pagan gods. So so that's why they would be called holy. Uh, This is what makes Israel's God different. He wasn't just holy in that his work was sacred and that he was set apart. He was holy in his moral purity. You you wouldn't look at the gods of the ancient world and say that they were holy in their moral purity. And in fact, the gods of the ancient world were so much like their human worshipers. Um, They were vindictive. Um, They were retributive. They were these gods that were capricious and malevolent, and you had to sacrifice your children to them to keep them happy. And they were they were in a moment, unlike our Lord, who is, you know, slow to anger. They they were angry in a moment. And 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 so you wouldn't look at these gods and say they were holy because of their moral purity. It was only Yahweh the God of Israel who was set apart in terms of his moral purity that was so far beyond um, sinful humanity. And so that's what made him set apart and different. And he, and he reveals himself to Israel this way. The scripture that, that I, that I have here is from Exodus 20 uh, verses two through three. This is of course, right where we have the, the 10 commandments. And the Lord says, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. 
So he's holy in that he's separate from those other gods. He's also holy in, in this regard. He is a loving and perfect being. He is a loving and perfect being. And so when he says to his people in Leviticus 19, 1 through 2, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, speak to the people of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for the Lord your God is holy. How do we how do we wrestle with that? Because that means that it is possible for humanity also to reflect what I've been describing to you, his moral character, his loving character. How do we reflect that? And I will tell you right off the bat that my hermeneutic, the way I approach scripture and interpret it, is if God commands us to do something like he says, be holy as I'm holy. My assumption is that he enables us to be able to fulfill what he's asking of us. I do think in many ways, if not, John Oswald gives the example, it would be like a man jumping off a 100 story building. And when he's halfway down to the ground, you you scream, hey, don't hit the ground. That that would be a, a cruel and, and, and malicious joke. And I don't think God jokes with us like that. So when he says, be holy as I'm holy. It is possible. And that's that's what we have to wrestle with here. So that's that's kind of a definition of it. Um, I'm happy to go into more, but I'll pause here because I've, I've been talking quite a bit there. So, yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. So what I'm hearing, what really stands out to me is you're saying, if I'm correct and, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're saying that. In with the pagan gods, the pagan gods were made in the image of man. They were just like sinful, human, fallen people, except worse <laughs> in some cases. And some of those stories were just insane, um, some of their mythologies. But in the case of the one true God, he's totally different from us because he's morally perfect in a way we can't even, we can barely wrap our minds around how perfect and holy in every virtue, perfect justice, perfect mercy, perfect compassion, perfect love. Um, and he's saying for us to be like him. Yes, uh, that, 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 is, that is the claim. And that is what scripture is saying. And of course, Leviticus 19. And how, again, do we reflect that moral, loving, holy nature of God, knowing that it starts in him and it doesn't start, and I think this is important, it doesn't start in things you do for him. It starts in him and in his person. And how do you and how do you reflect that character? Well, and that brings me to the next question I was gonna ask you. And I, I think you've already answered it just with that one sentence about it starting in him and not in us. Um the next question was gonna be, can you earn holiness in the sense of like an unbeliever just start doing all X, Y, Z, whatever holy works there are that you can do as a human. And can you earn holiness? But it sounds like you're telling me it has to start with God. It's not something we can do in our own power and might as much as there is a part of us doing something. So yes, there is some grappling we have to do here. Yeah. So I would put it this way uh, succinctly. A theology of holiness is a theology of grace. There, there is nothing within humanity, um, within ourselves and our fallen nature, that would ever just default towards holiness. So if we wouldn't default towards holiness, if our hearts and our minds are set on evil, if we drift from God rather than run towards God, then that must mean that in order for me to reflect the moral character of God, his holiness, that it has to be a work of his grace in my life. So holiness and grace, and I know a lot of times we didn't hear this so much probably, but holiness and grace must go hand in hand. They are inextricably linked. And a beautiful example of that, again, comes from the Old Testament. Because if you look and trace the deliverance of Israel from Egypt, right? God calls Israel out of Egypt through a mighty deliverance, what we call the Exodus. And it is through that act of salvation. So he's saving them out of Egypt 
that on, then and only then in Exodus chapter 19 on Mount Sinai, he establishes with them what we call the Sinai covenant, where he gives the Ten Commandments and he gives um, the moral way in which they're to conduct themselves as his holy people. But it is only after the act of deliverance. It's act, It's after their salvation. And then he says, now, as we live in covenantal relationship with one another, this is how I'm going to ask you to reflect my moral character. And 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 I I hope the, the listeners and, and the viewers can see nobody reflected that more perfectly than, of course, the person of Jesus Christ. When you talk about perfect love and you talk about perfect justice and you talk about someone who in every single way fulfilled that character, it was it was through him. Uh, and him alone. So I, I believe it will manifest in good works, but you can't get the cart before the horse. The gift of grace is given first, and then the good works follow. I love how Second Peter chapter one, verses three through four puts it: His divine power has given us everything needed for life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Thus He has given us through these things is precious and very great promises so that through them you may escape the corruption that is in the world because of lust and may become participants of the divine nature. So that's a description of holiness. It's his divine power giving us, gracing us with the ability to partake in the divine nature. I can't work my way into that. That's impossible. Yeah. Wow. I love that. Um, And that holiness that comes only through relationship with Christ. Um, How I've, because with being honored to get to work for Brian Holiness, I get to answer lots of messages. And one that I've seen more than once is, you know, where's the both and? Basically what we're grappling with right here. Where's that balance of God gives me holiness but also I do works and I am supposed to do these works. So am I earning holiness after salvation and how I've just started answering it? And Hey, maybe you wouldn't even agree with this, but, (laughs) but um, how I've put it to people is we're not working for holiness, like to earn it. Like, you know, you work for money. We're not working for holiness. We're working from holiness Mm. in the sense of, we are positionally in Christ, in relationship with him, partakers of his nature, and as an outflow of that relationship in obedience to his commands. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. Um, we do these works that reflect his nature and we act in accordance with God's nature. Is that somewhere in the ballpark, Josh? Oh, I would agree completely. Yeah, I think I think that's exactly what Second Peter um, is communicating as well. It's it's out of his divine nature that you've become participants in his holiness. And so should we be concerned about a Christian or someone who professes to be a Christian who snubs their nose at um, loving their neighbor, for instance, or who basically forgets the poor or um, who has no concern for the orphan or, or, or who continuously lives in fornication and adultery and, and, and moral impurity? Absolutely. Of course, you should be concerned about it. But in no sense are we trying to say that refraining from those things is what makes someone holy before the Lord. It is entirely and completely the righteous nature of God and his grace extended to us. And so I would put it this way. Our holiness is indicative of the work that God has done in our lives. We are not working our way to be holy. Awesome. Thanks so much. I have at least one more uh, main question for you, Josh. Before we go to that, uh, Andrew and Bethany, what what are you all thinking? Do you have any thoughts? Does that make sense to you? Do you have any clarifying questions for Josh? Go ahead. It's almost like, and I think, I don't know if this is going to help or bring more questions in, but I've almost, my way of thinking has changed we always talk about works and how we were working to earn and you're striving and doing all of these things to obtain. 
but it changes and, and this probably won't be the best example, but it's almost like it goes from it being works that you're doing to acts that come from you because everything has changed when you realize that it's not even because of you because you are not trying to gain something. And I can look back at my own past at how hard I worked and worked and tried to meet requirements to gain and obtain something like I was working a job to get a paycheck. And then when you have that moment, when you realize the true grace and love and the perfect love that God has and how it begins within you because it begins with him. It does change from a working to get something to an act. My entire motivation for things changes. Yes, I look kind of different on the outside, but my desires and the acts and the things I find myself doing and the way I find myself talking and reaching out to people and having compassion on certain people and seeing things that I never saw saw before, I kind of can almost only translate it as it was works. And now those things that I do that are different are coming out of acts of love and acts of service because it's him in me working through me instead of me trying to work to obtain something that's always been there. And like I said, I don't know if that makes it more confusing to bring the other words in, but that's the best way that I can explain the difference of working to something. And you still have those works that you do, but they're different. They're not works to earn something. They're good works like acts, acts of service and kindness and amazingness. Well, and you said something that stood out to me because you said it's Christ working through us. And in my head, I'm immediately, it's Christ working through me instead of me working, working. to get Christ. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's it's a completely different concept and you don't understand it until you realize all of the things that he has done for you because of you. It just... I did this early. You probably can't. You can't. You can't hear that, but it's like a mind, mind blow. Just... And I and I would say, in addition to that, too, that not not just that I'm not working to attain Christ, but I'm not working to keep Christ. I'm not working to keep yes. Him um, or to stay in the covenant. Um, it's in, and that's a different question of whether you you know, believe in apostasy and that's a, that's a whole other, like, you know, uh, rabbit trail to go down. But it, but, but no matter what a biblical theology of holiness is, you're not working your way into it. You're not working your way to stay in it. It's about understanding um, that it's a gift. I'm not an employee of God. I'm a child of God. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Man, that, that brings you up. Like it brings to mind the verse, and I know it's in Galatians, and I'm looking at Galatians, and I don't see it on the page. Maybe someone knows the reference, but it, it's the verse about what you begun, what you began in the spirit. Are you going to finish it in the flesh? Mm-hmm. I think that's in Galatians three. I was a Bible yeah. quizzer, but I didn't do Galatians. <laughs> I did Acts and Romans. <laughs> what a coincidence. <laughs> um, actually, here it is right here. Did you receive it's it's Galatians? I'll just I'll just read these few verses starting in Galatians 3. Oh foolish Galatians! Exclamation mm-hmm. mark. Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the spirit by works of the law or by the hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? So very convicting. And you can just hear Paul's frustration uh, with the Galatians who are trying to work and earn, uh, you know, basically sanctification because he said you've already begun in the spirit. You know, so why why are you trying to be perfect in the flesh now and leaning on the laws and the rules? And they even had the wrong rules, which we'll get into practical holiness in a, in a second. But before we go there, uh, Andrew, 
I'd love to hear some of your feedback after what Josh shared about the definition of holiness. Absolutely. Well, I love that description because like you had mentioned earlier, um, I was kind of in the same place where that until I left my particular church and even while I was there, I later in, in my um, course of ministry, I started questioning what that actually is and, and realizing it wasn't really properly defined because uh, it they just kind of allowed us to define that for ourselves because it was it was um, I guess it would be too arduous of a task to try to nail down every possible uh, checklist that you could create to contain holiness right and um, so I I still struggle with that and maybe I might pose a question um, and I apologize if it's kind of preemptive down the list but um, I struggled with the definition of holiness because I was always presented scriptures like, you know, Romans chapter 12 verses one and two, where you're supposed to present your body a living sacrifice, right? And so they would um, imprint this image in our minds that like the only way to please God is if you like literally present your body as like living sac- as a sacrifice, right? Which is an image of pain and suffering. Um, there's no pleasure to be taken from it. And then you have scriptures like in uh, James, where they talk about that faith without works is dead, right? Um, so my my uh, view of holiness was tainted by this because it always felt like a personal responsibility, that it wasn't something that was uh, out of a reaction to a holy God that we were that that that's why we are behaving a particular particular way. It was a responsibility we held. Um, amongst ourselves because um, it was that, or we would like lose out with uh, with God, and and that's why I love that you tied that holiness is interrelated with grace inextricably, um, and I never realized that you know um, because we had these base level standards that was just kind of well understood that you're supposed to do X, Y, and Z, but we always rose, uh, raised that threshold and it, that, that threshold never seemed achievable. You could never please God. You could never do enough to please your leadership. Um, and it's such a burden to be released off of one's shoulders when you realize that it's not something that you could even, even in all like your most perfect self that you could idealize you couldn't achieve the perfection of God. So um, I look forward to like us continuing the discussion on how to address kind of scriptures like that. But um, definitely that really gave me a, a difficult time growing up trying to uh, maintain that, that kind of a description of holiness. Well, just just how you said that, Andrew, um, the verse about present your body as sacrifice and that sacrifice, that word being tied with pain. So it's kind of like holiness is a painful thing, uh, almost a a miserable thing. Um, Yeah, I think that's an image I know I've been presented with. That wasn't with that verse and in that way. Um, But is holiness supposed to be? a perpetual thorn in the the flesh and Josh is a little bit impromptu, but what do you think of that <laughs> kind of view of holiness? Well, it's, it's interesting because um, I, I, I feel as though when we think about the word holiness, I think again, as we've already said, Jesus Christ represents the moral purity and moral perfection of God um, more than um, any human being who's ever walked the earth. And so when you think of Jesus, do you think that Jesus' holiness made him more appealing to sinners or less appealing to sinners? Mm. Because the interesting thing to me about Jesus is he was perfectly holy, and yet he was appealing to sinners. Jesus had a winsome side. Jesus had a humorous side. Jesus enjoyed people. Jesus even himself repeated he was repeating things that were being said about him. You know, he said, oh, yeah, well, um, 
you know, John the Baptist, he's the serious one, but they call me the partier. I'm paraphrasing, but there were, you know, he's, he's bringing that across. Mm -hmm. And so the, the idea of growing up in a lot of ways, seeing people who (laughs) holiness was almost just like, it was mean. It was just like, but, but Jesus wasn't mean. And who could, who could argue that he's more holy than these people that we're holding up and saying, look how holy they are. No, he's relatable. You know, he's he's telling people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And uh, and yet at the same time, he's sitting across the dinner table from you while he's doing that. Um, That's that's who Jesus is. So I would just say his holiness made him more appealing to sinners, not less. And uh, that's that's my that's my Lord. I want to follow. So. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. I completely agree. Um, and you brought to mind when I first started studying holiness, when I was first starting to realize, okay, what I believe about it, it's not lining up with what I see in scripture. And I started to dive in and um, study the Bible. Yes. But then also other resources. I heard uh, an analogy given of holiness, um, which looking back, is kind of funny at the time because I was still very much a holiness girl wearing the long jean skirts and all this. Um and they compared the first comparison of holiness was to like the, you know, the lady in the, the little theology video was like, holy, we, we tend to think of holiness like our pair of white skinny jeans. <laughs> I just remember as a holiness girl, like, nope, not, not what I think of it as, but actually I did. It, let me finish the analogy. She said, your white pair of skinny jeans, you put them on and the whole day you are on edge because it's fragile and you're worried and you're anxious you're gonna mess up your white skinny jeans and so you're walking around and you're cleaning off everything you sit on and you're staying away from anyone who's dirty and you're not gonna hug people because you might get it on your jeans if they've been outside and and uh, you're just walking around so careful and just avoiding people um trying to protect your holiness and um she said that's not what holiness is like holiness isn't fragile like that holiness is like the bleaching agent that turns everything else white. It's like that powerful bleach that was poured on those jeans and turned them white and everything else. Um, and I was like, oh my word, I do think of holiness like skinny jeans. <laughs> um, but but yeah, that really stood out that because that was my mentality before, like I've got to be careful and so careful that, you know, just almost like live in a bubble. Um, all separated to the point of I've got to avoid everyone who's a sinner. I don't know how I was going to witness like that. Um, and then I read the stories about Jesus and he's with the with the harlots and the publicans and the sinners. And they're looking at him going, you know, what are you doing? He wasn't worried about his holiness, you know, being so fragile that he was just going to lose it by, God forbid, being friendly towards a, a sinner. All I can think of, like, as a girl mom right now with that analogy is, like, glitter. And I just see Jesus and, like, every every part of him and how he encompasses himself as glitter. And everywhere he goes, there's a little glitter left behind. And um, that's totally because I'm a girl mom and we have crafts all the time and stuff. And glitter gets on everything. And it doesn't matter what you do. It's like sand at the beach. You cannot get rid of it. So I love your analogy of the white jeans, which God forbid we would ever think of wearing white skinny jeans versus, (laughs) you know, the bleaching agent. Because now all I can think is glitter and am I leaving a little bit behind me as I go? I just that another mind blown moment. But I love love that. I love the way you wrap that up. Yeah. So and and one more point I want to throw out there before we're going to get to the last question and last discussion question for you. Um, but but first, I just want to I'm going to put this out there. And if anyone disagrees, feel free to say so. But this idea of checklist holiness, do X, Y, Z, do it all perfectly, get all your ducks in a row and earn holiness. Isn't that the mentality of just about every other world religion? And isn't that the mentality of just about any cult you can think of? I'm not calling anyone a cult, but isn't just just think about whoever you think is actually a cult, whether you think of that as Mormons or Jehovah's Witness or, or, or whatnot, isn't that the problem 
the main problem with their version of the quote unquote gospel is it's all about earning salvation. And that goes for, you know, Buddhism or Islam or even other spiritualisms. And it's all about doing things and earning. And it's not about grace, forgiveness. Am I missing something? I think I no, think that's I, the gospel. That's what makes the gospel of Jesus Christ unique. So yeah, I, I don't disagree. Yeah. Sweet. It just yeah. So when we miss that message though, and when we start to teach our church members or portray holiness in such a way that they misunderstand holiness as something we earn, we miss the gospel. And we're just like all the other world religions. Yes. Pretty big deal. <laughs> You spend, you spend so much time trying to obtain something that you forget about what it is you're even trying to obtain. And then you find yourself in a place where you realize you don't have to obtain anything. It's a free gift. If I give you a Christmas present, I am not going to make you go clean my house to earn the mop that I gave you as a Christmas present. Not that I would give you a mop as a Christmas <laughs> that's present. Safe. That's a terrible Christmas that present. That sounds pretty based but if I gifted you something for Christmas, I would not require you to use it a certain amount of times and act a certain way towards it in order to keep it. It is a gift I am giving you. So I'm not going to give you a coffee maker and then require you to go make me 52 cups of coffee or have a fresh cup of coffee every day from your coffee maker. I'm giving you the gift, I'm not requiring to use it as I see fit or as I see necessary by my rules. It is a gift to you. And I know we could take that a million different ways, but that's the way I've had to rethink about it because I spent so much time trying to earn something. It's a gift. Yeah. You don't have to follow yeah. all of the rules to earn the gift. And that takes and I, and all the back to the whole works and acts thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Ahead, and, I, and I think it's really important to point out, too, um, especially for your listeners and viewers that might want to be thinking through these things. Um, you may hear a message that would say amen to everything that, you know, Bethany just said. That, yeah, we're we're living holiness um, because we're saved. We're, we're living holiness because God has changed us. And that might be what's being presented, but does the culture reflect that? I think is the key because I, I, I think a lot of people maybe that would be watching this would say, well, yeah, I've, I've, I've never heard anything stated otherwise, or I've never, and, and sometimes quite frankly, we would be a little defensive if somebody would tell us that we believed in works based salvation yeah. and we would try to defend against that and pretty vigorously. And we knew we knew Galatians and we knew how to defend against that. And yet at the same time, what did the culture reflect? And 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 does the culture and the day-to-day -day practice reflect this earning works-based mentality? So that I think that's an important thing to think about. Not just whether somebody would say amen to everything Bethany just said, but does the culture actually re reflect that? And and don't we want our culture to reflect an accurate theology? Right? So I think that's important. I'm so grateful for that clarification there. The, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah absolutely. I'll sit here in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to add uh, one one thought that I was saving, but it, it I think it works perfectly with what you were just saying, Josh. I'm about the culture reflecting. Is the culture reflecting workspace or is the culture reflecting, you know, the grace of God, relationship with Christ, partaking in his nature? Um First off, this earning holiness and earning favor with God in, in that very strict and rigid kind of way, that's not a holiness church thing. It's a human thing. And that's, I mean, that's why all the other world religions and all, all the actual, you know, technical cults out there have that works-based earning holiness, earning favor with God mentality, because it's a human thing. It's a very human thing. And that's why, of course, it's important to preach the gospel, preach the gospel, preach the gospel, because we're going to, we're not, we're, it's not our nature to get it. We're, we're just going to default to thinking we earn holiness. But as humans, when we see holiness as this very rigid, let's compare it to a point system. 
where it's like if you earn so many points, do so many works, you're 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 doing good. Um, so you think of it as a rigid po- point system. Now here's here's how it plays out in in the culture when you have that kind of rigid point system. Two things: one, you're going to have shame and self righteousness when you don't measure up and make all the points. You're going to feel a lot of shame, um, and you're going to feel like because you are going in that theology of holiness, that bad theology of holiness, you're going to view God as a harsh judge standing over you and so disappointed, almost like a -a whack-a-mole, just knocking the people down who don't score enough points. Um, And it's going to be very, and I remember, again, going back to my personal experience, I remember um, on days that I just, it's not that I did some great sin, it's just that I didn't feel like I'd done enough. I remember going up with the church to pray at the front and just kneeling there because I knew I couldn't pray to God again until I made a big show of repentance um, because there was just so much shame that I didn't measure up. So you have that shame element. Oh, and also when we imagine God um, as that harsh judge, no matter how you imagine God, whether it's right or wrong, you're going to become like that naturally. Um, so if we imagine God as a harsh judge, we're going to become little harsh judges and that's how we're going to treat other people. Um, and then the other, the other side of this, which I already alluded to is when we feel like we did do enough works and we did check all the boxes, we're going to be pretty self-righteous because we did it and look at us. And that's another fundamental problem of not having grace in our theology. Um, uh, if I can add to that, I um, I remember I was listening to a, um, someone doing a lecture on, you know, kind of what some of uh, behaviors manifest in bodies uh, of believers where grace is not interwoven into the theology, right? And it's very easy to get pulled away from not including grace when you've become so accustomed to, like, salvation, right? And so however your salvation doctrinal tenets are— that's the first thing that brings you into the church, and it's the easiest thing for you to tuck away when you when you start becoming a Christian. Because now we got to move on to the more uh, rigid parts of becoming a mature Christian. And one one of the things that they suggested happens whenever you exclude grace from your theology and pursuit of holiness is the sins of the tongue become most prominent. And um, and it, this is a reflection of. Um, like in Galatians later, I believe in Galatians 5, where it talks about the fruits of the Spirit, um, we start to s- replace what we think the fruits of the Spirit is. So in the example that you presented, the latter individual that's self-righteous, they start implanting what they believe the fruits of the Spirit are, which they'll, they'll name as like, you know, someone who prays very loudly in the altar or um, in our church, we were very um, demonstrative was the word that used very often. So if you ran the aisles, um, if you were very adherent to the way that you dressed, these were obvious signs that um, you were holy. So you would institute those as the fruits of the Spirit. And if that's the way that you feel, then you begin to judge others. Like you said, you you make yourself to be the kind of God that you're serving, Right which I would argue is, is a form of idolatry. You're creating a God that, de- that the Bible does not describe, you know? And so you, you, you become um, a little form of that God where you judge others the way you feel that you're being judged. Like, well, so-and-so is, n- is not as demonstrative as I am, and that manifests in gossiping and slandering and lies and in some extreme cases in different churches where they're actually like, well, if you're not behaving to these standards— then you're not welcome to be a part of our, our church body, or you're not, uh, we can't associate anymore. Um, and that is totally absent of grace. And um, I, I'm so grateful that we are not uh, able to take the position of God in the universe, because if some of us were given that position, uh, it would be almost impossible to gain favor or, or salvation. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So on, on that note, let's move into our last discussion question. We've already gotten on to a little bit, but I'd love to just flesh it out just a little bit more before we close. Um, and that last discussion question is, okay, so what does it look like 
biblically speaking, if we're just on an island, handed a Bible, um, you know, reading it for ourselves just from scripture and not from just, you know, how we're raised, which of course it's not technically possible to parse those out perfectly, um, but just hypothetically, what what does the Bible present as the practical fruit of partaking in the nature of Christ? And we've already mentioned a few of these, um, but I'd love to just look at a look at a couple scriptures and just think about it and just give our listeners that question too. If we were looking at just the Bible, what does the Bible portray? as the fruit of holiness, because you'd think if the fruit of holiness is sacrificing um, sleeve length or sacrificing uh, wearing a necklace or sacrificing, you know, whatever it is, the color red, they had that in Bible times too. And they had open toed shoes for that matter. And if that's the fruit of holiness, Wouldn't that be in scripture? Wouldn't we hear Paul and Peter and John talking about, you know, when you're really holy and you're, and you're kicking off your, I don't even know what they called sandals in Greek, but, (laughs) but, um, and, you know, changing them for those, what do you even call a normal shoe? I can't even remember that in English, but, but anyways, uh, what, what's the practical fruit of holiness? So Josh, uh, I'd love to hear your take on that before we end. Yeah, sure. I think I think again it goes back to the person and nature of God. I I don't want to sound like a broken record, but I think we have to keep going back to the character and person of who God is. And so if that is who it's all reflected off of, how does he reveal himself in scripture? And from the very first uh, beginnings of his relationship with humanity, he reveals himself as a God full of grace. So man, there's that word again, and I'm not going to stop using it because I love that word and I'm a grace consumer. I want more and more grace from the Lord. I want as much grace as possible because grace is the only thing that keeps me in right standing before the Lord. So his grace, when you look at the covenants of scripture, when you look at the fact that he made promises to Noah and he made promises to Abraham, think about this for a moment. Um, What was it that Abraham did that made him better than everybody else in order for the Lord to choose him out of his homeland and Ur of the Chaldees and bring him into this place in which he's going to make a covenant with him. Um, I'll just go ahead and tell you, you can look in Genesis 12 and try to find it, but you're not going to find it in Abraham's own righteousness. It was a calling of grace that God um, effectuated in Abraham's life. He called him out by his grace and his grace alone. He made Israel his peculiar people, the family of Abraham by his grace. So a practical outworking of holiness is that we would reflect God's character through grace. Are we showing grace, unmerited, unearned favor towards others? Is that in our life? The second one, and this is huge, is love. Uh, Notice love is the only attribute First John chapter four, in which it is basically a state of being statement where it says God is love. God is love. And so what does this mean? Well, from the very beginnings, when God is talking about his people living as a holy people, I love this. Leviticus 19. This is in the midst, by the way, of what we call the holiness codes of Leviticus. Leviticus 19, this is where God is saying, this is how you're going to live as my holy people. What does he front? What does he prioritize? What does he put forward to the people? It's this, you shall love Mm. your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. If, If it's a theology of holiness, it's a theology of grace. If it's a theology of holiness, it's a theology of love. I believe holiness is God's love being perfected in us. This is how I preach it. The more, the more of God's love that comes into my heart and fills me so much Romans chapter five, the Holy Spirit pouring his love into us, the more it fills me, the more malice, hatred, anger, strife, the more jealousy, the more rage, the more that pushes out as love fills me up. If I love you, I'm not going to steal from you. 
If I love you, I'm not going to try to take your wife. If I love my wife, I'm not going to cheat on my wife. These are things that are done out of a motivation of love, not of any other motivation at all, because that's who God is. We love him. We love our neighbor. And then finally, let me just say this, faithfulness. Grace, love, and faithfulness. Those three descriptors of God in Scripture stand out above all, where we see that God, as he comes to Moses and he speaks to him in Exodus 34, he says, telling him what his name is. My name is Yahweh, Yahweh, the Lord, the Lord. And then he goes on to describe himself as merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. By the way, that comes from the Hebrew term chesed. It's really hard to translate. Uh, Hebrew translators all over the map on it. It's been called steadfast love. It's been called covenant faithfulness. It's been translated as mercy. But essentially, when you think of God and how long-suffering he was toward Israel, that's what holiness should look like in our life. And lo and behold, here we are again. When I think of love, faithfulness, grace, I think of Jesus again. So it's 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 Jesus. And 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 then finally, you know, Andrew mentioned already the fruit of the spirit. I think the holiness comes through the spirit. And so it's only going to be through, of course, you know, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, general self-control. So that's wow. the practical outlook. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, that's exactly what I found when I started uh, studying holiness in scripture. So there's a saying, a lot of different men in, in the movement that I came from used, and I've actually started hearing other movements as well, but preach a little holiness. And usually when you hear <laughs> preach a little holiness, you know, it's going to be standards, you know, it's going to be holiness standards. Um, but I just started to to think as my late, late teens, early 20s, I was thinking, what is the when when Paul, when Peter, when John, when they when Jesus start to preach a little holiness, when they start talking about holiness, what's associated with that in scripture? Um, and I just started looking up every single reference to the, the Greek word, because it's translated different ways in the New Testament. And I just went to the Greek word in Strong's and looked up every verse that had to do with holiness. And oh my goodness, it was, uh, what was associated directly with those was kindness, tenderheartedness, forgiveness, love, uh, and just a truthfulness, giving thanks, righteousness, fear of God, blamelessness. And it, it, it was never close. <laughs> it was never all these outward standards and, and rules. And I've got a whole article on it. Um, New Testament evidences of personal holiness. So you can go to brianholiness.com, look at the article. I won't read the whole thing for sake of time. Um, I will read one verse um, just to show you what I mean about love being so intertwined and interconnected to holiness. And that is First Thessalonians 3, starting in verse 11 and through 13. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you and may, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness. And it's like, whoa, that was just a, that, those were like, increase and abound in love for one another and for all can't get much broader than that so that he may establish your hearts in holiness. And I was just like, whoa, that is so interconnected. That is so holiness and love. You cannot take those two apart. Mm. So yes, that'll be the fruit. Being like Jesus is the fruit of partaking in his nature and becoming holy as he is holy. So thank you so much. Um, to everyone who was on this panel discussion, it's been a great talk. Um, I want to give you all just a couple minutes if you have any closing thoughts. Um, Bethany or Andrew, do you have anything? Just kind of mind blown. <laughs> Not, I mean, I've gone through years at this point of studying everything that I have been raised with. It, it for me, it came from raising a daughter and you know, wanting to do right by her, but having it explained where you're shown grace and faithfulness and ultimately love as the fruit and the hand in hand, the product of holiness, the way to holiness and everything. It really just makes you 
stop and realize and the more you study and the more you learn and the more you read and the closer you grow to God, the more you see it evident in scripture, evident in relationships, evident in life itself. As a mom, it's been the number one thing that's helped me understand how God sees us. And I know you can't really understand that until you have a a child and you're in the position, but there's nothing I wouldn't do for that little human in the entire world. And there's nothing that little human could do that would make me break my love for her. So understanding that and understanding how holiness comes from love and how God's love for us creates our our way and our path into holiness. I know I've said mind blown a lot tonight. And, and if you watch the video, you'll see me just making lots of gestures. But it rocks your world when you realize that you cannot earn that love by anything that you do and that it is there for you. And it's one of the most mind blowing, but also one of the most comforting and reassuring things to know that the price is paid. There's nothing I can do. And I can rest in that because I am a very flawed human and I can't go a day without either being an emotional wreck or lashing out at my poor husband or stubbing my toe and getting angry. I can't, no matter how hard I try or no matter what I wear, I'm not going to live a perfect life. And knowing that it's not on me and putting all of my love into serving him the best that I can, it, it changes, it changes your world. And I could go on and on, but I love your explanation and your walkthrough. And I think it really just, it opens your eyes and it opens your soul to so much. So I really appreciated everything that you, your little lesson. I loved it. It meant a lot. Thank you. Andrew. Um, I think uh, Josh, you put it uh, so well. Um, And it's something that I'm still learning through right now. So I'm very appreciative that you put words to kind of some of the thoughts that I've been trying to piece together. Um, and I hope that, you know, to anyone who's listening, uh, that that they start this journey of uh, investigating a God that loves them, that that's the core of who he is. I love that you brought out that scripture that God is love. It's uh, not a component of him, a sub subpart. It is him its very nature and um i think when you try to separate that from god and viewing god through the lens of human nature um it's very easy to to have that overshadowed and uh, that that becomes so um it just creates a cloud of despair to anyone trying to live for god without without that core component so thank you for sharing that. And, you know, that's something that I'm working through right now. And uh, it meant a lot to hear it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, And Josh, we'd love to hear just your last closing thoughts. And then after you share that, would you mind to just pray um, just over this episode, over our listeners who hear this? Because I know there's going to be people who listen and this is the first time they've really thought about holiness in the sense of grace and love. And it's just so hard to wrap our minds around that as humans who are so used to just thinking in the terms of, of working for it. Um, so if you don't mind, just share your, your thoughts and then just say a prayer as we close. Really appreciate that. Yeah, I'd be glad to. Thank you, Natalie. And, and just again, thank you for having me on. And Bethany and Andrew also, it was just an awesome time um, getting to be with you guys and to hear your heart and, and your story of just learning to to rest in, in in grace and um and i think you know my only final words would just be an, an encouragement to um to all those who are listening and viewing that uh, you can be holy you can experience the holiness of god in your life and and i hope and pray that um whatever your experiences up to this point have been um that it not turn you away from seeking just that special relationship with the Lord where you can reflect his character and you can increase in his love. I heard an awesome, um, just, just a quick little, um, analogy and illustration of a, of a, as a dad, I relate to it where a dad is out 
working hard in the garden and uh, he's got his hands dirty and and it's it's during the summer and the sun's just beaming down and um his little girl comes up to him and she sees that her dad is tired and he really could use a drink of water and so she walks over to the water hose that's been laying out in the sun just just all day long just baking in the sun <laughs> and she takes her little cup that she's been digging in the mud and helping her dad with the flowers with and she takes that water hose and she fills it up with the fills the cup up and the, the water's just blazing hot the cup is dirty she brings it over to her dad she says dad i could tell you were thirsty i just wanted to give you this before, before you before you got overheated now as a dad i'm at least going to take a little sip because that would mean so much to my heart to see my little girl do that and so here's the question was her performance perfect Mm. no her performance was not perfect it was lacking but the question is was her love perfect in that moment and her love and her heart towards her dad was mature and perfect and beautiful and that's what i want to encourage you all with it's not about your performance it's about is your love being perfected for the Lord? Because the, the scripture says in First John, perfect love casts out fear. Mm. And there's no fear in love. So that's my prayer. And uh, let's just actually pray together right now. Father, thank you so much for this awesome group. And thank you for every single person listening and watching. And God, um, we come to you acknowledging that we need your grace. We come to you acknowledging that if it were left up to us to save and to keep ourselves, we would be hopelessly lost. But thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his cross. Thank you that your love was demonstrated towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, the ungodly. And Lord, we are so drawn to your cross. And we're drawn into this inner life where we experience union with you. And I'm so thankful that in that union where we've been called by your grace, drawn by your grace, and then filled with your love, that we can begin to reflect somewhat of your character and who you are. And Lord, we are not expecting perfection of performance. We know that we have these human infirmities. We know that we have this sinful nature that we deal with. And yet at the same time, we are holding out hope and faith and belief that we truly can obey and follow you and live a life that is pleasing and close, not to earn your love, but as Natalie beautifully said, just working from holiness. And so, God, I pray that um, this would be both the experience and the testimony of everyone watching, wherever they're from, whatever their background is, that they would come to know and to truly see what it means to be called to holiness. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank Thank you all. Thank you so much for joining us for this month's episode. Please consider following, subscribing, and leaving a five-star review. The Not Ashamed podcast is brought to you by Berean Holiness. We'll see you next month with another episode, but until then, check out the Berean Holiness website and social media for more content. May God richly bless you on your journey of rebuilding faith and discovering the gospel of grace.